our topic this evening is uh, the way, the truth, and the life. At the Last Supper, you said this uh, Last Supper with his disciples on Thursday uh, evening, one of the things that he told them was, uh, in my father's house there are many dwelling places, and I will prepare a place for you. And, and that's so crucial to us. We, we talk about life here after, we talk about uh, heaven, and it is something, the reality of which we know, but it is something that can really see us through. There will be difficulties, challenges, trials, suffering, pain, and at times uh, we might feel, you know, I, I can't take it, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if we always keep in mind and at heart that Jesus has prepared a place for us, that this is where the Father wants us, that ultimately, if we live the way of Christ, then we will make it to our eternal home. Then that is something that strengthens us. That is something that we will see us uh, through. But how do we get to heaven? Well, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we get to the Father and we become eternally in heaven? Well, we go through Jesus. We live our life for him. Uh, we obey his commandments. We uh, read about what he, he says. And we base our lives on that, so we are truly founded on the rock that is uh, Christ. So this evening, uh, this day, uh, I want to take a closer look at uh, the meaning of uh, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because uh, he is the only one. He is the only way. He is the only uh, Savior. And uh, the one who can be. Uh, unfortunately, today, modernism has come into the church, and we might get confused about many of these things. I look at what uh, Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. I want to relate that uh, also. I want to relate that to uh, modernism that has come into our church today, where we are being told there are many ways. To the, divine, to the divine, not just the one way, that is Jesus. And we know that truth is more and more being overturned. Many no longer know what is authentically true in our faith. And then when you talk about life, well, the world today and even within the church, the culture of death has already uh, crept in. So uh, it will be very, very uh, challenging, and we need to uh, to know uh, one of the things that our faith of Tentative tells us, what the Jews tell us, what does the uh, Bible uh, tell us. Before we go to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the, the life, uh, he says, I am. And, and I just want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, that. And you know that when God called uh, Moses, in Exodus 3, verse 6, uh, from the burning bush, then uh, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of uh, Jacob. And our way is God's uh, self-designation. I am who I am. And that means uh, uh, Yahweh. Now, Jesus, he told the Jews, as we read in John 8, verse 58, Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Now, it was clear to them what he was saying. But what he was saying, I am doing. Because what they did, the reaction 
was to try to stone him. Why? For blasphemy. He was a believer. The Son of God is very powerful. Uh, we see at the arrest of Jesus, uh, we read in John 18 verses 4 to 6, uh, when Jesus was, the, 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 the Romans and the uh, priests and the, the horde came uh, for him to arrest him, and Jesus said, who are you looking for? They answered, hey, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Well, he said to them, I am. They turned away and fell to the ground. It was the name of Yahweh. It was the name of God. It was a sacred name. And after even was to be God, it was powerful. They they turned away. They fell to the to the ground. No? And later on, uh, fast forward to Jesus already having gone through death and resurrection, uh, appeared to people over 40 days and now uh, going to return to the Father in heaven, he spoke about the Great Commission. And in Matthew 28 verse 20, he said, And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Now, you, you, can, you can look at that as simply saying, well, as, as uh, you and I might say, I'm with you. No, I'm going with you. Oh, I'll be there. But this, again, takes special meaning. I am. Jesus is. No, God is. Yahweh is. I with you until the end of the age. For always. Until finally you yourself make it to, to, to heaven. So, when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no, the the the, the uh, very important uh, two first words there. I am Yahweh, uh, talking about God. Okay, so let's take a look at the three aspects that uh, Jesus said about himself. First of all, that he is the way. Well, again, Jesus is the only way. When uh, Peter was uh, brought before the elders and the scribes in Acts 4 verse uh, 12. He said, There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Now this, this is a very important verse. Uh, Especially during this this times, not just concerning the pagans out there, not just concerning the many other different religions that are out there uh, claiming to be the one true religion, uh, and not just even uh, talk, talk, and, and but but also uh, including talking about those who are people of faith, who are uh, Christians, and we need to know the the reality. There is no salvation through anyone else. It is only Jesus who is the Savior. It is the only way by which the human race is to be saved. And that's according to God's intent. That's why he sent his very own son, God, to become man in order to redeem us, to win for us our salvation. So th there is no other. And, and uh, today there are so many who, who claim to be the, the saviors, but this is one uh, basic uh, reality that uh, everyone needs uh, to know to know about. Now, but when we say Jesus is the only way, we also need to see that in today's world, people look to various ways for well-being. worldly pursuits. They want to be in what satisfy. Now, of course, when you talk to uh, to those who do not really know Christ, uh, many of the things that we ought to know does not really satisfy. Where for them, now this is what is satisfying. What, what are those? Money, uh, sex, uh, power, 
alcohol, uh, drugs, and, and people, many, many people in the world are in the world seeking these things because they are looking for, again, uh, what they, they think is well-being for them, what will make me, me happy, what will make me uh, fulfilled, what will be good for me. But we really need to know that that is uh, never the case and this worldly pursuits can uh, bring us actually to uh, destruction. Now, when we talk of Jesus as the way, one challenge is even with the spirituality in our church. Because again, there's the disservice of uh, modernist uh, teaching. So what are some aspects of those? There are many, but uh, let me cite a few. Uh, which we've also taken up in some of the previous podcasts. So first there is what you call religious indifferentism. The people are indifferent to what religion they have. Uh, why? Because it is claimed that all religions lead to the divine. If you're a Hindu, just be a good Hindu. If you're a Muslim, be a good Muslim. And of course, if you're a Christian, be a good uh, Christian. Uh, and it will lead you to the Divine. This is modernist teaching within the church. And there are even those who say God wills a diversity of religions. That God wills it. That there will be very many different religions. How can God will such a thing? God might allow it. And certainly uh, he allows it. Just as he allows us to, to uh, choose uh, sinful lives, but God would never will it. God wills, desires everyone to be saved. Again, that's why he sent Jesus. And so God wills that people come to the one through faith. We cannot accept this uh, religious indifferentism because it makes people you know, be, be uh, satisfied where they are. In fact, how we sit with uh, Freemasonry. Uh, in Freemasonry, they actually insist that there, you should have a belief in, in a divine being. Uh, so that's good, you know, rather than being an atheist, but uh, that's good. But the problem is your belief in a divine being can be in any one that you consider to be divine, in any uh, religion. And that's why uh, uh, for them, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Buddhism uh, whatever it is, as long, long as you believe in, in the divine, it is acceptable. How can that be acceptable? Again, there is only one true uh, faith. And in this one true faith, Christian faith, of course, uh, is the only way to, to making it to heaven, and that is through uh, Jesus now, with modernism, if you accept such a thing as a religious indifferentism, that all religions go, uh, are ways to the divine, then there is no incentive to evangelize and to convert. Why should you? And, and why would the, 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 the church even say, go uh, and, and convert? Now, of course, we know Jesus said, uh, proclaim the good news all of uh, creation and go and make disciples of all the nations. But if people can find their way to the divine in other religions, then the focus should be something else. Uh, how can you be a good uh, person? Uh, how can you be at peace in the world? How can you uh, not do bad to, to your fellow men? Uh, but not to be a Christian. That's why there is a disdain for what is called the proselytism. But you know, proselytism, the meaning of proselytism, it just means converting to the faith. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is the very command of Jesus, to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is that? To convert them. That is the intent. And, and, and today, evangelization might be even given so many different meanings. Again, just be uh, a good person, do good to all, don't hurt, hurt anyone. 
uh, be a nice person, no? uh, get along with others. No. Evangelization is proclaiming the good news of salvation in Jesus so that people will repent of sin and turn to faith in Jesus. That they should become Christians. Followers of, of, of Christ. But modernism in the church uh, might tell us otherwise. And then uh, with modernism in the church, as against Jesus being the only way, uh, there are some that say that the way forward uh, is what is being called now the New World Order. And we've spoken about that, and uh, I will not go extensively into that. But a New World Order where there, is, there will be a one world rule, supposedly so that people will be together. Because you have different religions, you're fighting each other, you know, Christians against Muslims and, and uh, Hindus against Muslims. So they just have uh, one world rule where we uh, uh, enjoy international fraternity, where uh, perhaps there might even be a one world religion. Uh, of course, there won't be, certainly not an authentic uh, religion. But people, even within the church, want to remake things to reset things into a new world order. And of course, the people who will end up running that new world order would be the uh, unelected elites, uh, the bureaucrats that even today uh, are already running roughshod over uh, the whole world. And uh, they're very much uh, anti-God, anti-family, anti-life, anti-Christian. -anti you know? In fact, this kind of uh, new world order uh, and one world rule and uh, uh, this, this international fraternity you know, are Freemasonic uh, concepts. But they have come in, into the church. So Jesus is the only uh, way more what that food truly means. Okay, the second thing, Jesus is the truth. Now, there are a number of uh, things that, well, three is supposed to be the truth, is contrary to the truth, but there's also the second, a half truth. And then, uh, thirdly, there is unproclaimed truth. Okay, so when, when we talk about the truth, the opposite, the converse, what is supposed to that is not just the lie. But it can be a half truth, it can be an unproclaimed uh, truth. So uh, let's take a look at uh, each of these things and uh, right at the John when God created the perfect world and created the first human beings, Adam and Eve, uh, they actually were perfect. They were sinless. Mm -hmm. And they related directly with, with, with God. Mm -hmm. And that is how God intended, uh, hopefully, things to be. But unfortunately, sin came, came in, the, say, the serpent tempted uh, Eve, and together with her, uh, Adam, they sinned and they fell. But what was the essence of what made them fall? It was a lie. Because the serpent told Eve, you know, Eve was saying, we, we should not eat of this fruit in the middle of the garden. God, God told us not to. And uh, the serpent said, no, did God really tell you that? Actually, you will not die. Because God had said, you will die. Now that's, that's quite a dire warning. You know, it's not just saying, I'll get mad at you. <laughs> I won't speak to you for a day. Uh, or you'll get sick or you'll get spanked. No, you will die. And the serpent said, no, you will not die. A total contradictory uh, statement, a total uh, lie. And in fact, the, the serpent went further. You will be like gods. So he, he was Adam and Eve in a perfect environment having everything that they needed that would make for a truly 
full life in, in Eden, walking and talking with God, but the serpent injected all of these things. Oh, don't believe what God told you. Uh, uh, he's just preventing you because you yourself can be a God. And today, the evil one uh, still tells us a lot of uh, uh, lies. So, first is the lie. Second, there is a half-truth. Now, a half-truth is what he said is actually true. You know, but it is twisted to lead to a lie. Uh, the intent is actually to deceive. So, telling the truth, but intending to deceive. You know, and, and some way, somehow twisting that, that truth to achieve that, that purpose. You know. uh, for example, uh, there are those who would say Christianity is uh, not a religion, but a relationship. Now that's true. Christianity, as it's very basic, is a relationship with Christ. But it is also a religion. It is also within the context of a particular faith. That relationship with Christ can only truly happen and can only truly flourish and we can only truly live our life in, in Christ if we have a religion that gives us the commandments of God, that uh, shows us his way, uh, that, that have uh, the elements, uh, the aspects that provide grace uh, into our lives. But what, what the modernist uh, might say, no, it's the uh, relationship. So you try to live as Christ, meaning to say you should be honest, you should uh, love, love others, uh, you should uh, heal the sick, you should do good to the poor. So you, you live like Christ, you be a good person, and that's the important thing. And of course, that's important. That is the truth. But if that is all that there is, there is, there is that, that the lie. Because to be able to only truly live your life in Christ again uh, is to be part of the faith that he established. And within this faith, within this religion, everything else uh, comes to precisely enable us to live our lives in Christ. Another example of a half-truth. You know that there are very many cults that uh, use the name of Jesus and use the Bible. So they say a lot of true things about Jesus. They say a lot of truths that they quote from the Bible. Now, of course, they misquote a lot of things also, but, but they also quote a lot of truth that is there in the Bible. And, and even even... The, their names uh, contain the name of Christ, Iglesia de Cristo, uh, Church of Latter Day Saints uh, of, of uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the Mormons. So there's a lot of truth that is in there, but mixed with the truth is the falsehood, and uh, the falsehood, the, the the truth that is there is intended to deceive people into accepting what is not fully true. You accept Christ, but this is a different type of Christ. This is not the authentic Christ, the authentic Christ of the authentic Bible and of the authentic faith. But this is a Christ that is being proclaimed by self-proclaimed prophets or cults. So there are many of those in the, the world. So it, it becomes uh, quite a problem because people can be deceived because what they can see, what they believe is being told to them is the truth, but with a lot of uh, lies uh, mixed in uh, with that. Okay, and then the third thing that when we talk of opposition to truth, there's the lie, there's the half-truth, and there's, there's the unproclaimed truth. When someone does not actually speak out the truth 
when the truth needs to be spoken out so that people will know what is true. So one particular uh, egregious, egregious, uh, egregious example uh, in the world today in uh, uh, Western uh, liberalism, like in the U.S., you have many Catholic uh, politicians and office holders who, are, who claim to be uh, devout Catholics who will go to make a show of going to Mass and going to Holy Communion, or I don't know, maybe they, they believe that, uh, but are rapidly pro-abortion. Of course that cannot be. Abortion is not accepted in the church. The taking of innocent life, the innocent unborn, more especially, that, that is not uh, accepted. Now, the unproclaimed truth is that truth, but those who should proclaim it so that people will know are not proclaiming it. Priests, bishops, and even lay leaders. That's why if, even for me, I'm not, I'm not sure now whether uh, these this, uh, people, uh, President Biden, uh, Speaker of the House Pelosi, New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, I, I'm actually not sure whether they're just uh, hypocritical liars that they know they are not truly Catholic, but they make a show of that, I don't know to win Catholic votes, or are they truly misinformed? Are they truly not properly educated in the faith? Do they really believe that I, as a Catholic, can be for abortion? Not just for abortion, but to, to, to push it, to, to put all the forces of government behind it, to promote even greater uh, numbers of abortion in the land. That, that, that's the support of the shepherds, of the pastors. And so that is the lie that they don't proclaim the truth, that they are quiet about the truth when it is important to, to be able to hear the truth. So when we talk about the truth now, we look at the uh, modernist uh, teaching uh, give a number of examples, but uh, how, how it is such a disservice to what is actually the, the truth. Now, more and more in our church, modernism that is coming into the church, there is growing acceptance of homosexuality. And of course, in the culture, it's already been accepted. Uh, it used to be that uh, homosexuality was intrinsically disordered. It was a psychological, psychiatric disorder, and that has been totally removed. You know? And it's now accepted. It's now uh, normal. But even within the church, homosexual <coughs> relations, active relationships are intrinsically sinful. But for many now, uh, priests, nuns, bishops, Lay leaders, uh, that is not truly, that is no longer the case because it is being accepted. Now, what are the different uh, teachings with regard to this acceptance of homosexuality? Uh, well, there, there are those who say, God made you this way. If God made you this way, then it should be okay. I mean, God made me. God made me. So, this is right. But, of course, it is wrong. It is clear in the story of creation, Genesis 1, verse 27, that God made them male and female, just male and female. No in between, no transgender. Now, of course, there are those who, who are gay who are transgender, and, and that comes about because of social contract, con, construct. But God did not make you that way. God made you a man. God made you a woman male or, or female. So the, the, the assault against the truth is uh, uh, right there. And the, the modernists uh, today would even go to the extent of saying that uh, uh, women can have uh, penises and uh, men can have vaginas. It goes to the ridiculous, but it is accepted. If you're woke, 
it is accepted by by many. So no, God did not make us uh, that way. Okay, what else? Well, when you they talk about accepting homosexuality, you know, because uh, we talk of uh, the the act, the homosexual act is uh, sodomy. A man having uh, sexual intercourse with another man, and uh, the uh, sodomy comes from Sodom. You know, what happened to Sodom, and we know uh, the story uh, of that. And uh, Sodom was destroyed by by fire and and brimstone, brimstone. And and the modernists say that, well, yes, Sodom was destroyed by fire from heaven, but. The sin of Sodom is the lack of hospitality. Now, this is what you would call a half-truth because it is true that part of the sin of Sodom is the lack of hospitality. But the modernists just emphasize that and totally disregard uh, homosexual sin. But what is the truth? Well, we, we, we look at the Bible. We, we read in Jude 7, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding towns, which, in the same manner as they, indulge in sexual promiscuity and practice unnatural vice, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. When did fire come down from heaven and burn uh, Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground because of sexual promiscuity and unnatural vice? That's what the Bible says. And that is what is true. That is the reality. Okay, what else? In this whole aspect of accepting homosexuality, uh, there are those who say when faced with someone who is uh, openly uh, homosexual, who, who, who does not hide it, who, who openly says that they are act into active uh, homosexual relationship, there are those who would say, well, who am I to judge? In other words, I, I will not say it's wrong. I will not say it shouldn't be. Uh, I, I will not say anything negative. Who am I to judge? Now, the reality, the Christian uh, teaching is, of course, we can judge. Not, not just talking about being judges in a court of, uh, of, of law, uh, but uh, anyway, talking about... Uh, courts of law or, or lawsuits, the, uh, we, we read uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses uh, 2 to 3, when uh, Paul was berating the Corinthians for uh, bringing lawsuits among, between themselves, among themselves, before pagans, before the unbelievers. And uh, he told them, Do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you unqualified for the lowest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Then why not everyday matters? Okay, so talking about judging, uh, talking about judging the world, judging uh, the, the, the angels. And there is no prohibition against judging. It is part of, of life. You look at something and this is wrong. I judge it to be wrong. It is not wrong to judge that something is wrong if that something is wrong. <laughs> now, what, what does it mean then? Uh, because Jesus also says that we should not judge. Uh, what it means is we should not be judgmental. See what... Uh, uh, Jesus in Luke 6 verse 37 he said stop judging and you will not be judged stop condemning and you will not be condemned forgive and you will be forgiven so that's the whole context that is that is the, the verse it is not just stop judging period that's what the uh, modernists uh, say stop judging period so here is someone who is obviously and admittedly in a homosexual relationship, and I say, who am I to judge? No. If we accept the reality 
in Christ and in the church that homosexuality is wrong, then we can judge that that is uh, wrong. But what what uh, it 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 does mean taken together in, in in that in that verse, it is not looking at something objectively and knowing that it is right and wrong, but it is being judgmental, meaning to say condemning. It is being condemning because only God condemns. And and forgiven you will be forgiven. Only God is able to forgive. So it's not my place to condemn. Now we, we condemn the act, but not the person. Okay. So again, the basic principle of uh, 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 hating the sin, but loving the sinner. Okay. So we can condemn the act an act that is objectively morally wrong is to be uh, condemned. But we don't condemn the person. So we are not judgmental in that way. We don't judge what is innermost in the person, even though it might be uh, obvious from the person's uh, words and, and uh, actions. You know? uh, and then we read in John 7, verse uh, 24, it says there, stop judging by appearances, but judge justly. So, can you judge? Yes. But judge justly. Not just by appearances. People are so quick to, to judge and to condemn today. I don't like something and I already make a judgment. Uh, I see some someone doing something that... Uh, I disapprove of, I already make uh, a judgment. But we're not supposed to be rash in all of that. No? Because we, we don't judge just by what we can we can see. There's so much more that we might not be able to see. And so we judge justly. No? We do justice to the, the thing or the one that we are judging. Anyway, but this whole point is that we can we can judge. Unlike those who say, uh, who am I to judge in the face of uh, overt homosexuality that is right before them? What else in this whole aspect of accepting uh, homosexuality? Well, there are those modernists who approve of uh, civil same-sex unions. Any kind of same-sex union cannot be approved, cannot be accepted because it is wrong, it is sinful. No? And some people say, well, no, it's civil. It's not church, it's not sacramental. That doesn't matter. No? It would be worse if it was a church or, or people uh, giving a sacramental blessing, but we, we cannot approve of what is objectively wrong, what is uh, immoral. So, unlike modernists in the church, we cannot approve of civil same-sex unions or any other type of uh, homosexual uh, relationships. Unfortunately, it's so widespread in the church, the acceptance of things like this. What else? Just, just one more thing about the whole aspect of accepting uh, homosexuality. Uh, there are the modernists who say, you know, we're, we're supposed to love. So again, that's a truth. You know? So when you say you should love, you should love others, you should love even your enemies, that's a truth. You know? But then how you love is, is what uh, can make all the difference, whether you are loving rightly or, or not rightly. So the mother may say, you love by affirming the choices of people. So if your if your uh, child, and I do say child, because even when they they are young, you know, uh, and there's gender dysphoria, and uh, uh, the the world is telling them, uh, well, you can choose whether to be a boy or a girl. A boy can choose to be a girl. A girl can be, choose to be a, a boy. Now, there are those who, the modernists in the church say, well, if you really love your children, you 
affirm their choices because it is good for them. This is what they choose. This, this makes them comfortable in, in their choice. And obviously that is wrong. If they are making wrong choices, and, and if you're a boy and you say you're a girl, you're a girl, you say you're a boy, you obviously are making a, a wrong choice. And that will lead you to perdition, that will lead you to hell. You're not going to make it to, to heaven. And so to affirm that wrong choice is not loving, but in fact, cruel. Especially in cases like this, where parents are supposed to take care of, of their children. And pastors are supposed to take care of the sheep, of the faithful. So... Love is not uh, just affirming uh, wrong choices. So that's the whole aspect of accepting homosexuality. What other aspects of the service of uh, modernist teaching when it comes to the truth? Well, it is accepting abortion by silence. So I think there are, uh, in, in, in the church, uh, many, even those who are pro-abortion, would not openly, uh, I'm talking about Catholics, and especially the, the priests and nuns and the prelates, would not openly say abortion is okay. Yeah. Even the Catholic politicians that I was mentioning in the U.S., uh, they say, no, we believe abortion is not okay, but we don't want to bring our faith into our public life. And so if the, there is a law uh, that abortion is okay, then their position is abortion is okay. And of course, that's, that's uh, totally, totally uh, wrong. But the disservice of modernist teaching is when they accept abortion by their silence, by not saying that it is wrong, that it is evil, that it is uh, immoral. And for pastors, for shepherds, especially for bishops, if they don't uh, condemn uh, those who are pro-abortion, especially those who are prominent in, in, in public office or in entertainment or uh, in, in uh, business, any a public figure, a prominent public figure who is a Catholic, who is uh, pro-abortion, and the shepherds, the pastors of the church do not say anything against that, do not say that it is wrong, then it totally misleads people. Because they're, they're so obvious. It's not like the, the uh, bishops uh, would say, ah, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't want to pray into their private life. I didn't call them and say, interrogate them. Well, what are you for or against abortion? But they're very public. Everyone knows. And by not speaking out, they are in effect affirming uh, this this uh, this uh, great great sin, and then there are those prelates in the church that put abortion. So they they don't accept abortion, but they put the issue of abortion on the same level as social justice issues. They they call this the seamless garment uh, theology. That if you want to talk about being pro-life, then look at all of these different issues. And so it's not just abortion. How about immigration? How about all those uh, uh, poor people who are uh, fleeing, fleeing persecution and are really down and out? And uh, we should uh, fully accept them because it's a pro-life issue. It's about their life, their, their well-being. How about uh, climate change? Oh. That, that uh, if we don't do something about the, uh, well, what's happening to the climate, oh. then it will affect the very lives of people. In fact, the alarmists have, have said all sorts of things, that uh, all, all sorts of predictions that have not come through. Uh, the end of, uh, uh, in effect, uh, the world for people, it has not come through. But there are those who put, abortion on the same level as these social justice issues. And that's wrong. When it comes to life, abortion. 
is the primary issue. That is the truth that people need need to, to know. The other issues are important as well. But uh, uh, you cannot just justify now, oh, and for this politician who is, who is uh, pro-abortion, because he also, I also agree with his stand on, on immigration or climate change. That, that is not uh, on, the, on the same uh, level. Then I, I think I would even go further when we talk about accepting abortion by silence. Uh, again, in, 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 in the U.S., we, I, I talk uh, uh, a bit about the U.S. because it's the uh, superpower that influences much of the world. And when it comes to faith, family, and life, what uh, transpires there uh, is translated to uh, the rest of the world. It's pushed down the line uh, to the rest of the world. So uh, there are those who accept abortion by silence by me being members, active members of the pro-abortion uh, Democratic Party, which is a party of death. Now, they have said this. They are open about this. This is their, these are their principles. These are their party platforms. Uh, they're not denying it. They're not hiding it. It is very clear to all. They're pro-abortion. They're uh, pro-divorce. Pro, pro uh, uh, they are pro-euthanasia. Uh, they are pro-LGBT. Uh, so this is the open platform. And they are actively pushing that. How can an authentic Catholic be a card-carrying member of that? They are actually priests and may, maybe even some bishops who are card-carrying members of the Democratic Party. How can that be? That is a total contradiction. That is a total uh, rejection of what is true. The truth about how evil uh, abortion and LGBT are and all these other aspects of the culture of death. Okay, I'll, I'll give uh, one more uh, example of the, the service of modernist teaching. Uh, so the first was... Uh, how people accept homosexuality, and uh, the second was how people uh, accept uh, abortion by their silence. Uh, a third way is when modernists say in the church that there is no hell. There is no hell. Or a variant of that, okay, there might be hell, there might be hell, but no person can go to hell, or hardly any person goes to hell. And what's the reasoning for that? Because God is a God of love. How can God, the God of love, condemn someone to eternal fire and damnation? How can that be? So, so they, uh, to them, the, you, you cannot put those two together. So ergo, you know, they reason out, then there, there, there is no, no hell. Or if there is, then no one ever goes to hell. No. They even claim that Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus, that Judas is perhaps not in hell. There are some who say, you know, Jesus called him friend, actually, and Jesus kissed him. Actually, Jesus did not kiss him. Judas kissed Jesus because that was the signal for the authorities to arrest Jesus in the garden. And, and you say, friend, it, it doesn't mean to say that uh, really a friend, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term, it's an expression. And, and even you know, calling someone friend or, or, or brother, you know, that person can, if, if that person still does, does what is uh, truly wrong and evil, that person will end up going to, to hell. Now, why, why, would, why would the church, the church actually, in all of this time, uh, has held that uh, Judas is in hell? And there, there, there are many that are there. The road to, to heaven is uh, narrow 
but wide is the road that leads to damnation. We read in the scriptures. And uh, especially in Matthew 26, verse 24, when Jesus was conversing with uh, Judas, uh, one of the things that Jesus said, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. This was talking to Judas as he was going to betray Jesus. And well, why would you, Jesus say that at all? It, it was, it was uh, perhaps a final effort to, to get him to not to do his evil act. But right there, Jesus was saying, well, what does it mean? That it's better for you not to be born at all. Why would that be better? Because to be born and then suffer the fires of hell, the eternal fires of hell, it is better that you are not born. So there is a very dangerous uh, teaching. For one thing, people will no longer fear the fires of hell. Uh, of course, when we repent of sin, the ideal there is because we love God. We hurt God. And we don't want to do that. But in reality, for most people, because they're not yet there in the relationship with Christ, they're not really going forth in, in holiness, then, then fear is an important deterrent, even in life. Fear deters us from doing things. So the fear of hell is important no? to, to also help keep us in line. And then as we go forward in our life in Christ, that, that fear of hell is being replaced by uh, an authentic love of God and more of a, a love for, for, for heaven. There is another variant on this, uh, there is no hell uh, uh, teaching, modernist teaching, and that is, uh, there are some modernists that say that, well, when you die uh, and you are not set to make it to heaven, you just disappear. <laughs> you just go, poof, you're gone. Uh -huh. So you, you're neither here, here nor there. You, you're not in heaven, you're not in hell, but you just disappear. And of course, that's not true. There is eternal life. And in eternal life, after purgatory, there's only heaven, there's only hell. You don't just disappear. Many people would like that. I enjoy myself in life. Money, sex, and power. And I just do what I, I like to do. And never mind what this sin is about. Uh, I enjoy life. This is what I know. I don't know what is what they say about the afterlife. I don't even believe uh, that there's an afterlife. There might not be an afterlife. So I enjoy, enjoy, enjoy here. And if I die, poof. I'm just gone. It's quite a disservice to, to Christians. That's modernist teaching. Now, we know that in, in John 8, verse 32, uh, it is the truth that sets us free. So, uh, sets us free from a number of things. First of all, the truth sets us free from bondage to sin. Your sin is enslavement. You are enslaved to sin. Once you sin, you start sinning. You can get out of get get out of it. That is a form of enslavement. In fact, when we look at uh, uh, early after creation, uh, after Adam and Eve, they had uh, Cain and Abel, and Cain, of course, uh, murdered his uh, brother Abel. Uh, and this is what God told Cain in Genesis 4, verse 7. If you act rightly, you will be accepted. Because he was angry that his offering was not accepted. Uh, Abel's offering was accepted, but his uh, was not. So he was very angry. He, he killed his brother. So God says, if you act rightly, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies in wait at the door. Its urge is for you, yet you can rule over it. Sin lurks at the door. Sin is just out there. You step out and, and you're exposed to a world that is uh, in sin, in darkness. 
In fact, now we don't even have to step out the door. But uh, what this means is sin is right there waiting uh, to pounce, to take hold of you. And of course, the, the devil, the intent of the devil is to trip you up, to let you fall into sin so that you can be enslaved. But God tells him, yes, sin waits at the door, but if you act rightly, then you can rule over it. You have the, uh, the choice. And if you're a Christian, trying to live your Christian life, you have the grace of God and the strength of the Holy Spirit to overcome temptation that leads you to, 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 to sin. But what I'm pointing out here is uh, sin is, is there, and it, it wants to enslave. And actually, unfortunately, when, when sin came, uh, you see, uh, we, we need to see how very powerful sin is. And, and so from, from Cain, his uh, very evil act, uh, then the populations of, of the world grew, uh, and then we come to uh, the world right before the flood. And what was the situation of that world, the world at that time? We read in Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human beings was on earth. And how every desire that their heart conceived was always nothing but evil. What an indictment. The, how great the wickedness of, of human beings on, on the earth. Their every desire was nothing but evil. So this is sin that built on sin, that carried on through the generations, that became worse and worse until it became the culture of the world. And it became natural <laughs> for people to, to sin. And God saw that. And he wanted to start over. He uh, destroyed everyone except Noah and his uh, his uh, family. But unfortunately, how is it today? We live in a world of sin and evil and darkness. It's all around us, and it's very powerful. It's hard to resist everything that the world offers. And, and it, it, it is enhanced by the weakness of our flesh. And of course, the evil one is always uh, tempting us, keep uh, pounding, trying to bring us down. So, sin is enslavement, but the truth of God sets us free from bondage to sin. Secondly, the truth sets us free from worry and anxiety. It's a big uh, destroyer during these times. Even uh, secular psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, 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 people uh, say that a, a big thing that uh, can truly really destroy is worry and anxiety. And it can people lead, uh, lead people to, to suicide, uh, hopeless situations. And uh, people are so very worried. And of course, there are much to worry about in the world. But this thing eats them up and, and they're unable to, to function uh, normally. So what is the antidote uh, to this? Well, Jesus is the truth, the truth uh, that sets us free. So we are to put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus. And many, many uh, passages in the scriptures about trusting in him, hoping in him. Uh, one favorite of all of ours is uh, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 and following, talking about a future full of hope, where God says to, to his people, For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare, not for woe, so as to give you a future of hope. This is what God wants. This is God, God plans his eternal plan for the world. Uh, and of course the world fell into sin, and they chose something else. But then God entered into covenant with the people, and uh, part of that covenant is assurance of a future full of hope. If you live according to my ways, if you obey my commandments, then you can look forward to, 
to, to good things. Then verse 12, when you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. <coughs> How wonderful it is that we can come to God, and of course you come to God, wherever you are right now, and, and you call upon Him, you, you, you pray, you speak to Him, and the assurance of God, I will listen to you. This is God, the creator of the whole universe, the all-powerful God, for whom nothing is impossible. I will listen to you. You have an audience. You have my ears. I'm all ears. What a great uh, assurance. And when we worry, when we're anxious, okay, I'll go to God. I'll go to my Father, the Father who loves me uh, so much, who wants me to enter into eternal life with Him. I can go to Him and He will, he will listen to me. In verse 13, when you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart. So it's not also just a, uh, an automatic formula. Oh, I, okay, I'm praying, God, I'm calling upon you, this is what I need. No, it's, it's not that. Prayer is a relationship. And you need to grow in that relationship with, with God. And, and uh, the first and greatest commandment is to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if that is happening, then this, this assurance of God uh, will be true for our lives when we seek Him with all of our heart. Verse 14, I will let you find me and I will change your lot. Uh, wonderful assurance. That's, that's uh, all that we, uh, we really need to help us overcome uh, worry and, and anxiety. I want to bring you to another uh, passage. It's I mean the you know, New Testament. should also be quite familiar with you. Romans 8, 28, and what Paul says uh, after that in verse 28, he says, We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. All things work for good if you love God and you are living your life according to His purpose. Okay, so the, those two conditions. It's not just all things will work for good, period. Uh, no, if you decide uh, sin, uh, your life is going to be terrible. But if you, if you uh, love God, and, and all of us can say, yes, we love God, we might fail in loving God fully, but we're striving. We don't struggle with that anymore. We don't question that anymore. We, we, we love God. And then, uh, the second, if you are called according to His purpose, you know, that we try to discover our purpose in life. What does God want us to be? What does God want us to do? And of course, he talks about holiness, about righteousness, about uh, obedience, about discipleship. So all of those things that we as, as uh, Christians would actually uh, uh, should be doing. And if we do these two things, then all things work for our good. What, what, what more assurance do, do, do we need than, uh, than, than that? And... and uh, so the the proper posture, uh, we, we read later on in verse uh, 31 and 32. Well, then shall we say to this, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything else along with him? God gave us his very own son, Jesus he suffered and died for us. He won for us our salvation. And if God gave his most precious son, why will he withhold anything else? He did not withhold his own son. Why anything else? So this is our assurance. God will give us every good thing. And later on, he, Paul says, we can never be separated from the love of God. In, in verse 35, what will separate us from the love of God? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? And he answers his own question in verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor present things nor future things nor powers nor height nor death nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing at all can separate us from the love of God. 
if all of these are true, and of course they are true, then they should set you free, free from worry and anxiety. <clears throat> okay, third thing, truth sets us free from fear. Now, fear is also very, very debilitating. The fear is a God-given emotion. You know? And uh, uh, there are instances where it is right for you uh, to be afraid. God puts that uh, as part of our uh, nature you know, to warn you about danger, for example. So you're afraid to just walk by yourself in the middle of the night through a very dark and uh, uh, narrow alleyway. You know? It's right for you to be afraid, so you, you avoid that. But uh, very many times in the Bible, very, very many times, we are told, be not afraid. Be not uh, afraid. Uh, this is in relation to our faith walk because fear hinders our Christian uh, walk. In Christ, we do not have to be afraid. In fact, uh, Psalm 23 verse 4 uh, tells us, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. We, we do walk in a, in a world that is uh, in, in the shadow of death. Death is all over. I'm not just talking of physical death, but more importantly, uh, spiritual death. You can throw in uh, emotional death there as well. But even if we're walking in this world, and we cannot avoid, we are the world, though we're not of it. Uh, we, in, in this psalm, we say, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. If the all powerful God is with you, if Jesus is, we are yoked with Jesus, if Jesus is walking side by side with us, will we ever be afraid? No. Because we know that uh, our Lord will truly care for us. In fact, uh, Jesus is a good shepherd. And so here it says, your rod and your staff comfort me. The shepherd's rod uh, staff uh, was used to, to rescue the sheep. They were lost if they were caught in the in the uh, 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 the bushes. You know, or um, the, the staff might be used to repel uh, wolves and, and or predators against the sheep. So, the Good Shepherd, who already laid down his life for us, is there for us, will not allow us to, uh, to, to be, be, be harmed. And so we can go with our Christian walk and be safe from, from fear. Even fear of death. We should not be terrified even of death. Why? Because death is the gateway to life. You want to make it to heaven, you need to die first. Or at least be here when the be still here when the Lord returns in his in his in his glory. But uh, we don't need to be afraid of, of death. This is what Jesus said to Jairus, Jairus regarding his daughter. Jairus had gone to Jesus. My my daughter is uh, very, very sick, is about to die. Uh, please come and, and heal heal her. And what Jesus uh, told him in Mark 5, verse 36, fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Or another translation, do not be afraid. Just have faith. And of course, uh, Jesus healed uh, his daughter. But we have faith in Jesus. We put our trust in Jesus. And we can, we can face anything and everything, even, even death. I know that the, the, the Lord is there for us and things will work out uh, for us. So the truth sets us free from fear. Then just one more thing. Uh, the truth sets us free from being hindered from our destiny of greatness. We are destined for greatness. Why? Because we are called to holiness. We are called to be like Christ. We are called to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Uh -huh. And we are destined for eternal life in heaven. So all of this talks about being destined for greatness. We are to be like Jesus. And even in this life, we are given divine work. We are already participating in the work of Jesus and continuing with the work of uh, salvation of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. But 
the enemy, what the enemy does is to make us focus on our weakness, on our sins, on our failures, you know, and saying, you're not worthy, you're not capable, you know, you're not equipped, you don't deserve, you, know, you should be ashamed of yourself. So, we, uh, we, we are being uh, hindered by this, this type of uh, fear and listening to the wrong person, the evil one rather than to Jesus. Because it is true that we are weak, that we are sinful, that we do fail, but this is uh, part of it. God knows uh, who we are, what we are. God knows what we are able to do, but by the power of God, He empowers us, He uh, equips us. If we respond faithfully to the call, then uh, since we're doing God's very work, and it is actually He uh, who in effect uh, gives effectiveness to the efforts that we do, then we, we, we should be set free, being hindered uh, from attaining to the greatness that uh, is our destiny. Okay, so that's uh, the truth. Now let's get to the third. Jesus, I am the life. And God, of course, intended fullness of life for us on earth that happened in Eden. Adam and Eve had a full life. It was a perfect existence. But they sinned, so Eden was lost. Paradise was lost. Uh, and evil abounded, and uh, the flood came. But after the flood, God started over. And God entered into the first covenant. And that covenant was with Noah. And God reiterated to him what uh, he had told uh, our first parents, be fertile and multiply, subdue the earth. So it was the very same thing that God intended from the very start, but he was now starting over. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, more sin that came into, into the world. Uh, so God tried another tack. So later, he raised up a people. Uh, slave people in Egypt and raised them up to be his own people. And again, he entered into covenant with them, with Israel. And part of that covenant, I will be your God, you will be my people, is God's promise of, of peace, of, of fulfillment, of uh, family harmony, uh, even of prosperity. So again, all the good things. God wanted to raise a people that will show to the whole world this is a people whose God is the Lord. And because their God is the Lord, this is what happens to them. Uh -huh. They will enjoy all the good things that I intend for my creation, for my, for my creatures. And even today, this is what should happen. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not what we are. Why? Because people, including Christians, are violating their covenant. They are not living out their covenant with, with God. So, God cannot be faulted. God uh, had the, the greatest plan for his creation. Unfortunately, sin, the evil one, thwarted that, that plan. And so here we are. <laughs> in, in a difficult uh, situation uh, in, in life. But still, God is still there, what we've been seeing. And uh, we still look to eternal life in heaven. If, it, if that perfect life is not going to happen in the here and now, though, though a lot of good things will happen in the here and now, but uh, it will happen when we finally make it to heaven. And on this earth, we're just pilgrims. We are uh, just passing through. This is not our homeland. Our homeland is in heaven. But again, we, we still look to many blessings in this life. Now, looking at modernist teaching, uh, how how uh, it does such a disservice. Uh, what are some aspects of modernist teaching? Well, talking about the uh, international fraternity, the brotherhood of all. Now that sounds good, and it should be good, but uh, you know, like like uh, even even saying that uh, the Abrahamic religions that Abraham is the father of uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Well, 
uh, by blood, I, I, I suppose. No, we, we can trace everyone's uh, everyone lineage back to to Abraham. But Abraham, as a man of faith, he, he did not establish these religions. But there is only one faith that can say that our father is Abraham. Not, not just father by blood, but more importantly, father in the spirit, father in the faith, and that is uh, Christianity. And, and so when, when there is talk about international fraternity or brotherhood of all, well, we need to put that in, in proper context. Huh? Because uh, the only true brothers and sisters that we have are those who are in Christ. It is not everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and if we say, no, we, we, we're all brothers and sisters, so, so this is just on a human level. Yeah. And that's why uh, we cannot attain true peace, which I think is the intention. Maybe it's a good intention. There is a brotherhood, so true peace. But it cannot be attained apart from Christ, apart from God, the authentic God, not just the gods of, of all of these different religions. That's why in all of this time, through the efforts of very, very many peoples and groups and institutions, uh, uh, the world is still not at peace and will not be at peace unless it is the peace of, of, of Christ. So that, that's a disservice. That's not what authentic life is, is about. Uh -huh. And then with modernist, modernist teaching, if we follow through on this, that is looking to, again, uh, more to, to, to humans, to human institutions. You know? uh, for example, the, the United Nations, as a way for uh, peace. But we know that there is no peace. This world has been characterized in, in all of this time by wars and a lot of wars, and even up to now. And there's a greater threat for, for war, war, world, world war uh, in, in the world today. You know? uh, and, and again, you know, the, the UN can do a lot of good things, and it does do a lot of good things. But if you look to peace, banking on human fraternal uh, brotherhood and unity in that way, it's not going to happen, unfortunately, because uh, it is apart from, from, from God. In fact, you, you look at the UN, again, doing, doing uh, some good things, maybe a lot of good things, but also unqualified support uh, for the culture of death. Supposed to be about life, supposed about unity, supposed about supposed to be about peace, but uh, unabashedly pushes the uh, culture of, of, of death, yeah. pushing abortion. Yeah. And certainly, there's no peace in the womb. The, the 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 womb should be the most peaceful place, the safest place, but it's the most dangerous place on on earth, actually. Then the UN pushing uh, LGBT which is totally against uh, God's design. So this is this uh, the service, looking to human institutions to achieve uh, what in our hearts uh, is put there by God and desire for unity, for peace, and for authentic brotherhood with, with one another. And then what, what else? Well, there, there, when, when you talk of, of life, you, uh, the modernists also talk about the life of the planet. So this is uh, environmentalism. And uh, what we see today is uh, climate change alarmism. Now it's true that climate changes. It goes up, it goes down. It goes very cold, it gets very hot. So again, here is, here is uh, that is uh, the truth. But the, the lie is in the alarmism, in the hysteria, in saying that uh, uh, it's already the end of, of the world for for, for us all, for, for human life. And they've been predicting that uh, over the last uh, uh, hundreds of years, even up to today. And it never happens because it's not uh, going to happen. The world will only end when uh, God deems 
uh, the world. You know, we, uh, the, the time that our Lord will will return once once again. You know? But this type of environmentalism designed to enhance life in the world can actually work against life. You know? For example, the uh, much of the uh, liberal uh, establishment is uh, rejecting uh, fossil fuels, oil, gas, uh, coal, uh, and they want uh, clean fuel, solar, uh, wind, uh, sea. And on the surface, that, that's, that's good. But I don't know how realistic it is. I don't know, maybe 50, 100 years or, or more down the line. But in the meantime, what, what, what happens? Uh, you saw what happened recently to, to Texas that relied a lot on, on so-called clean energy. And when they had a deep freeze, everything stopped. And uh, the windmills couldn't, couldn't uh, operate. And solar power was uh, uh, none, sun was not coming out, they could not uh, generate. And so everything uh, stopped. It was like they were in an, in an ice age, everything was shut down. And then you also need to look, you know, because many of these environmental issues are coming from the Western world, the first world, uh, woke, those who are woke. But you also need to look at the, the third world. They cannot afford all of these things. Even, even the first world cannot afford many of these things as yet. And certainly the third world cannot afford it. But they need like access to electricity, to cheap power. And how can that come? By coal. Coal-fired plants. And, and uh, the, the technology is being improved more and more now that people claim those who are uh, promoting it that there is a cheap, uh, there is a clean coal, of course not as clean as uh, uh, solar or or wind energy, but they're, they're cleaning it up, you know, and they're able to limit the pollution, but it comes cheap and it is something that helps life in the third world. People are dying in the third world simply because they don't have uh, uh, electricity in many different ways. So. This uh, modernist teaching uh, on the surface uh, can seem good, but can be quite a disservice. Now, what kind of life are we to, to live? Because we are in a fallen world today, uh, propped up by modernism in our church, where uh, right is wrong and wrong is right. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, egregious examples uh, that uh, really are already uh, bordering, not bordering, but actually uh, in, insane, inane, and ridiculous. You, know, you have uh, transgender women, meaning say biological men, who uh, compete in women's sports. That's a terrible thing, will destroy women's sports. Then there are such transgenders who are in prison who are now uh, being transferred to women's prison because they say they identify as women. These are men, transgender, saying, uh, I'm a woman. And, and you know, the stupid the society is actually transferring them to women's prison. This is ridiculous. This is uh, insanity. Uh, then uh, recently, uh, you read about many of these things, and I was reading about uh, talking about uh, COVID and masking up, and of course the science is not is not uh, fixed. Uh, there are many who also say that uh, actually uh, masks are masks are not uh, uh, effective. But anyway, uh, there was this family was ejected from a flight uh, in the U.S. because the baby that was with them, who was less than two years old, did not want to mask up. Well, you try to put a mask to. Uh, a, an infant uh, that is younger than two years old. The first place is, is uh, bad for the infant, but also the infant 
itself will 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 resist that. Click breathe, and and it is just ridiculous when when you eject this this family that fulfilled all the other requirements, but because they had this baby and mass baby, thrown out of the flight. There was uh, one instance that I read about where uh, a pregnant woman uh, was carrying a, a baby. Her baby was ejected from mass uh, because uh, she would not ask up you know, from mass from the Eucharist. Now, there are many who go to church uh, who do not necessarily mask up. You know, and and and. Well, what is, what is bad about this particular situation, it was the priest who called the police. So the police came and took this woman out. Well, what is this world coming to? What, what kind of, of, of life are we uh, looking at when, when all of these things, uh, secular humanist, modernist uh, things are happening uh, right, right before us. So Jesus is the life, and when we look at fullness of life, what what that means is, we 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 need to live for God. We need to 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 serve God, you know? And and this was the example of Jesus himself. In Matthew twenty verse twenty eight, he said, uh, "Just so the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many." That was uh, the intent of his life, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom, to be willing to give up his life in order to, uh, to save uh, many more. And then, of course, when we talk of life as uh, Catholics, uh, most crucial to us, the source of authentic life is the Eucharist, where we eat the very flesh and drink the blood of, of Jesus. And, and Jesus himself says in John 6, verse 53, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. And this is how important it is. This is how fortunate we are as Catholics. But now the, the state uh, using uh, the pandemic as an excuse, of course, there are things that we need to do, protocols that we, we look at, and the church often does that, but it's shutting down churches and many of our Catholic prelates are just uh, cooperating with that, sometimes even being ahead of secular authorities. But Eucharist is so crucial to our life. It should be the source of life, of healing, of fullness, of strength, of, of health. But even in normal times, there are many who do not partake, many Catholics who do not partake. There are those who do not believe in the real presence of Jesus. There are those who, who might go to church and receive communion, but do not do it with reverence and with awe. So, all of this uh, impinge on the fullness of life as we ought to experience it. And finally, then when you talk of uh, true life, true life necessitates death, as I, as I said earlier. You know? And of course, Death is the way to eternal life. But even in this life, true life necessitates death to self. That means embracing the cross. That was the, Jesus went to the cross and that's where he died. And we are called to follow in Jesus' footsteps. We embrace the cross and we, we die to self. Meaning say we, we deny ourselves. We don't look to our own uh, well-being, but we are willing to uh, give up uh, things uh, in order to be able to live for 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 God, you know? and of course Jesus says in talking about death as a way to life in John twelve verse twenty four to twenty five, Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal. Uh, life. And Paul uh, says in Philippians 1 verse 21, for to me life is Christ and death is gain. 
so totally contrary to the thinking of the world. So afraid of death, so not wanting to die, wanting to prolong themselves. Some uh, rich people even have themselves uh, frozen uh, to look to the time when uh, the world science will come up with how to revive the dead, and so <laughs> they're there. But, but uh, death is the way to life, and even death in the here and now, dying to self, is the way that we truly live for Christ. So, brothers and sisters, today, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But today, so many have lost their way. So many do not know the truth. And so many are destined not for life, but for death. The world desperately needs Jesus. And the world desperately needs to know who is this Jesus who is our Savior and our Lord. This Jesus, as he himself says, I am the way the truth, and the life. And the good news, Jesus is here, and Jesus is with us. And we saw Holy Week, the, the core of the Christian faith, what Jesus has done for us, how he gave everything, his very life, so that we truly would uh, live. Amen. So let me let's go on to your, are there many questions just to know so so I can shorten my answers? Seven. Okay. So please explain more why Freemasonry is against being Catholic. Uh, okay. First, first, first and foremost, uh, I, I did mention that in Freemasonry, what is important to them is that you believe in the divine. But it can be any. You know? It can be Allah. It can be a, a Hindu deity. You know? And so this is totally incompatible with Christianity. Because Christianity, there is only one true God. You know? the, the, the Trinity. And so if uh, uh, in this particular group or organization, uh, it's okay for you to just be a Buddhist or a Muslim. Well, that's okay for them, must be Masons, but it is not compatible with Christianity. You cannot be a Christian and be a Freemason because that's what Freemasonry believes in. It is totally contrary to uh, uh, the Christian faith. Secondly, and this is what uh, many do not know, uh, but there are 33 degrees in Freemasonry, and in the first few degrees, it's all about international brotherhood. So it's it's good. It's it's nice. It is something that uh, we should all strive for. But as you move on, uh, you will see that uh, from the history of Freemasonry, it has always been against Christianity. It has always been anti-God. You know? And for those that go on, especially to the last three degrees. Uh, it appears demonic. And I, I'm sorry, there are uh, Freemasons out there, there are Catholics or Freemasons, there are clergy, clergy who, who are, and maybe all they see is uh, uh, down there at the bottom, and uh, well, what's wrong with this? It's just uh, fellowship. But that's what's wrong with this. It's not compatible with Christianity, and what it truly is, it is demonic. You know? And uh, it's unfortunate. If, uh, of course, they don't reveal that in the early stages, but that's where it uh, goes to. What is lacking in church formation of the flock if there are many who are Catholic in name only? What can they do if they just see the people on Sundays during Mass? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot that is uh, lacking in church uh, formation. Uh, in in for many Catholics, there are so very many who are just nominal, who are just uh, Christians in name, but they're not living out the Christian faith. And maybe even many of us, even though we were basically good people, uh, prior to meeting the Lord and entering into a new life with Him, 
No? We, uh, we, we, we did many things and, and got into many sins and disobeyed commandments of God. Maybe we didn't even know, even know the commandments of God, but we live lives as Catholics, at times going to church, receiving communion, at times going to confession, but not realizing the fullness of what it means to be a Christian. That's why a lot of formation needs to happen. And like for us and many others, they find it, uh, unfortunately, not in, 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 in the, the church. I'm not saying the church lacks formation. I'm just saying it's not enough. And this is our experience. And in the parish, there's a lot of input that is in the parish, but not, you see that there are many also uh, lapsed Catholics. There are still many uh, nominal Catholics. There are many that are easily taken by the sects and in the cults. But it's only as we uh, came into a group like MFC that there's a lot of formation, a lot of teachings, a lot of uh, 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 solid uh, input in, in the faith that we really get to, to, to see what uh, Christian life is all about. So this is something that is uh, lacking. And we in MFC, we try to do what is our share especially with the Live Christ Share Christ. We share everything that God has given us in MFC with the parishes. And we say, uh, let this be your program. These are your how-tos. This is what is needed in uh, the church today. And we will accompany you. We will teach you. We'll transfer technology. And so this can be done uh, even much more. But there is something that is uh, uh, very, very much uh, needed in our in our church. You know? So, uh, when when people just see when uh, the priests, for example, or the bishops just see the people on Sunday during during mass, uh, first of all, you know you you have an hour, even though it's the the most important aspect of our Christian faith, it's the core of our Christian worship, the Eucharist. So that's all important. But if uh, a Catholic does that, he does. And then at the end of the Mass, the Mass is ended, go in peace, and then he goes and lives his life in the world. I mean, not necessarily being a bad person, but uh, not, not growing in holiness, not growing in discipleship, not striving for Christian perfection. You know? uh, then that is so so very lacking. You know? And and even uh, with regards to the, the Bible, for example, uh, in church, uh, it is said that if you go to Mass in, in three years, you will basically hear the whole uh, New Testament. Of course, it's not, it's not everything, but, but basically the, 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 the Gospels, uh, not, not the New Testament, the, uh, the Gospels, you know. Uh, but, you know, you, you read it for a few minutes and uh, there's a short homily on it. Uh, that's once a week. What is that? We need to be getting into the Word of God each and every day and spending much more time and not just reading it, but studying it, meditating on it, basing our lives on it. That's why St. Jerome said, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of God. So, so uh, it, it cannot just be gauged on what is seen uh, in the Mass, as important as that Mass is. And then, uh, secondly, uh, there are many who are not there. Uh, sometimes our authorities, uh, spiritual authorities, are lulled into complacency because masses, especially in the uh, Philippines and maybe in places like Africa, they're full. And we have so many, many masses on Sunday or with anticipated Saturday. And so people think, oh, how, how vibrant, how so many are in church. But the, the people you see there are only a small uh, percentage of the total uh, population of Catholics who, who should be there but are not there. Why are there many pastors and preachers from other religions who have converted to Catholicism? Well, because if you truly are a pastor and preacher and you truly go into the Word of God and you are truly open, you know, because the Word of God it's a two-edged sword. It really cuts through. Uh, the Word of God is true. You know? And if you don't put your own interpretations uh, into that, but you uh, read the Word of God and you try to really get into it and you, you ask others and, and uh, 
uh, if, if these pastors some way somehow uh, are looking into the claims of the Catholic Church and they really search the scriptures, it inevitably will lead them uh, to the one true faith. That's why you have these uh, many pastors who actually have converted to Catholicism. It is the one true faith. And it simply is unfortunate that there are so many uh, out there, especially among the born again and the uh, evangelicals who are stressing so much the Bible. I admire them. They know so much more of the Bible than we Catholics do. They Catholics do not know the Bible, and that is unfortunate, and we should. But I admire them. But if they really get into it, then they will discover the authentic Christ of the Bible and the one authentic faith that Jesus established from the day of uh, Pentecost, uh, founded on Peter, who has become the first Pope, and that unbroken line you know, uh, is simply the Catholic Church. And so they, they, they discover it and convert. How do we go against woke culture, which is judging others who don't agree with you? Uh, wow, that is a very, very big challenge because uh, the culture today, the zip guys, the culture of the age is so, so woke. <laughs> uh, woke means, by the way, where people say that I'm awake. I, I, I know, I realize what is right and true. And of course they don't. Because what they, uh, what, what uh, uh, woke culture, which is associated with uh, liberalism, with uh, progressivism, uh, with uh, modernism, you know, as we've seen in a number of these uh, podcasts, uh, the, the right has become wrong and the wrong has become right. The good has become bad and the bad has become good. You know? And they uh, promote and define all of these uh, wrong things, the so-called culture of death, uh, including abortion and, and LG, LGBT. So, unfortunately, that is the dominant culture in the world. In the most powerful country, certainly the United States, it it, it used to uh, have for a long, long time the Judeo-Christian culture. That is what built the world in the United States. That is what uh, came up with educational institutions and and hospitals and and uh, much of the learning, you no, know, and the morality, Judeo-Christian. Uh, culture, but that is now being overturned by modernism and in, in again this uh, primary country, the, the US, which is pushing its, its uh, diabolical ideal, this ideal, diabolical ideology, the ideology now to the rest of the world, you know, uh, all the institutions have been overrun. Uh, the, the educational institution, the public schools, maybe even the private schools, the, the Catholic schools where, where this uh, lib are, are given liberal education and no longer really uh, in the authentic faith. And right there when they are young, they're being transformed into these woke, so-called woke uh, individuals. And then everyone has come into the picture. It's not just the usual uh, culprits of the LGBTs and, and, and Hollywood and the Democratic Party, but it's, it's a big tech, it's big pharma. Uh, it is uh, all of this, many of these major corporations, uh, these politicians, even uh, people in the supposedly conservative Republican Party. So it's been overrun. And, and right now, this is what is transforming the United States. That's an ongoing process right now, especially with the new administration that is dominated by the Democratic Party of Death. And so uh, it is a terrible situation now. Um, how, do you, how do you go uh, against that? Well, we live our Christianity. We need to know what is authentic Christianity? And for us, as authentic Catholics, you know, even though we might be a remnant and we certainly will be persecuted, we're already being, Christians are already being persecuted, especially the Catholic Church, then we, that's why we, we have all of these things about, about uh, suffering, about death, and how uh, uh, you, you can be blessed. And, and the early Christians, uh, that is what actually uh, happened, uh, happened to them. And then uh, 
Uh, when Paul was persecuted, he rejoiced in that. It's a badge of honor. So we need to all of these things. We need to know the reality of the Christian faith, and we need to live it out. We need to uh, stick to it. We need to do whatever it is we can do. And we work at evangelization and renewal, starting with the Catholic Church. That's why we go first. I mean, we, we go with everyone, but with a particular emphasis on lapsed Catholics. Those who are supposedly Catholics, but are not even truly Christian. So we, we start with them. And, and this is much work that needs to be done. But so one, we will live our life for Christ. We understand what that is, and we live that life for Christ. And two, we do the work of evangelization and mission and to reach out to many more. Then, uh, of course, in particular, when you are talking about uh, uh, the world culture out there, uh, well, you do whatever it is that you can. You, you never conform to it. Uh, you can battle it out in social media, though you need to be very careful as well. You don't want to get too, too involved in that. And uh, oftentimes it is, uh, can be very, very difficult, but these are the things that uh, we need to do. And in our circles of uh, influence, we, we say what is wrong with this so-called uh, woke culture, which is uh, with this uh, liberal, progressive, uh, modernist uh, culture in the world uh, today. So that's an uphill battle. Uh, and actually, uh, unfortunately, we are losing the war. <laughs> so, so uh, but you know, uh, that doesn't mean we, we give up. All the more we should persevere. That's why in MFC we also talk about being holy warriors. So we, you, you need to know also about all of this, about uh, modernism, what is happening in the church, what, uh, what uh, uh, pastors and shepherds, even hierarchy, might be teaching uh, that is wrong, but seems good, seems nice, seems uh, reasonable, but it's not really. So you need to learn about all of these things. Inform yourself. And all of these things together is what we can try to do. Why are there so many priests who are homosexuals? Paano nangyari yun? Well, what, what they are saying, uh, just we, we're running out of time, so uh, long story uh, shorter, uh, is this was really the infiltration into, into the church. And some say that uh, that is the uh, communist infiltration. Uh, they actually have their... Their, their their book called the Alta Bendita, where they outline. So they, this started to happen uh, 60, 70 years ago, you know, and and uh, to overrun the institutions, uh, the institutions that form people. So the schools, uh, the media, you know, uh, entertainment, you know, all the other all the institutions, especially the church. You know. So there was a concerted effort to uh, bring homosexuals, uh, especially to the American church. We know a lot about the American church because, because of social media. And there's a lot of what is happening there. And it's actually the epicenter of all of this. Uh, as to what is happening in other countries, we, we don't know. Uh, is it a, a spud? Hopefully it's not a spud. Hopefully the faith is still as strong in many other places. But in the US, we know uh, a lot more uh, there. So. The infiltration of the church happened from uh, 50, 60, uh, 70 years ago. So, uh, in, in fact, it is said that uh, today, I think it's openly said that, and, and you can see, you know, uh, by the way, many, many priests and nuns and some bishops talk, you know, the, the acceptance and pushing of uh, homosexuality and the culture of death. So, uh, it, it is said that, that today, uh, about half, of the clergy in the U.S. are homosexual, and and a good number also uh, among the bishops. Either they're homosexual as well, or they are they are homosexualist. Meaning you say you're either homosexual or you are a sympathizer. You agree with uh, uh, homosexuality. You know? So this is deeply ingrained, and of course we know that that's true because of the scandal. You know. That, that it came out, it blew, so it came out, and people know, and the American church has paid out four billion, four billion US dollars to settle you know, uh, lawsuits against uh, homosexual clerics. So we know that is a reality, it is there, it is true. You know, 
but the extent is uh, frightening. But that is what happened, that's why it's there. And that's why it is important to have uh, zero tolerance about this. And the, people, the church sometimes speaks about it, but carrying it out, I, I don't know, uh, it's another matter. And then it starts with the seminaries. You need to screen the seminaries. And there are many homosexuals in seminaries, unfortunately, even, even here in our okay, own country, <laughs> because as we have uh, experienced it in uh, uh, interacting with some of them, we, we know that that's, uh, that's there. So, so uh, the situation is already bad, but uh, the, the seeds for even uh, becoming worse has already been planted. What should be the posture of hearts when we are the one being condemned by many because of our stand in conviction? Is it okay to just agree to disagree? Uh, well, we always stand, of course, on what is uh, true, you know, what is good, what is just, what is uh, right. We can never compromise on what is the truth. Uh, but yes, uh, it is okay to agree to disagree. And uh, we were talking about... Uh, uh, loved ones, uh, close friends. Uh, now, now I, I'm not talking about uh, in in a community where we disagree on option A or option B on how to do mission. That's a totally different thing. We're talking about uh, 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 our stand in conviction, so the conviction for Christ versus those who who are on the other side, you know, who might condemn what we, we stand for, who are against what we stand for. You know? uh, so we, we stand always for uh, the truth. You know? And we continue to impart that. We never compromise on that. Uh, but we want to look at those who disagree or who might condemn us, uh, you know, because we are to, to love everyone. And we are to have the desire of God uh, in our hearts. He wants no one to be lost. So we don't want anyone to be lost as well. So we, we don't want, we hopefully do not want uh, the, uh, any close, like close relationships to be permanently cut. You know? Because you look to the time when possibly conversion somewhere or someone can come, either through you or not through you. So uh, uh, relatives, friends, uh, you, you totally disagree, you've discussed it, you've given your opinion, you've tried not to uh, really fight about it. Uh, you've been uh, passionate, but then at the end of the day, uh, totally different views. Okay, uh, we agree to disagree. You know? and, and maybe at some future time, we revisit it. Uh, God is always at work. And at times, we are just surprised. Someone that we were trying to convince, we were never able to convince. And then suddenly, we just hear uh, a few years down the line, oh, the, the person has uh, converted, uh, has become an authentic Christian. Should Poli first receive the vaccines like Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, which were developed or manufactured by using cell lines from aborted fetuses? We have uh, two minutes to answer, but can take two hours. <laughs> uh, so it's your decision. Uh, and, and why do I say that? Because uh, the Vatican and Pope Francis says it's OK. I disagree with it, and there are uh, others that uh, disagree with it, especially those who are truly pro-life. Uh, we need to have we need to have a high standard of being pro-life. Remember, we as MFC, uh, we are to defend faith, family, and life. And uh, this this uh, vaccines developed from fetal uh, cell lines. And, and again, I, I don't want to get into that. There's a lot more to be said about that, but that's a reality. And there's a division in the church, those who say, uh, yes, it's okay. Uh, and those who say, no, it's not okay. Uh, I am in, among those who would say, no, it's not okay. But uh, I would not uh, condemn anyone who, uh, like Pope Francis would say, it is okay. So you need to, to, to study, you need to pray, you need to, to discern, you know, uh, in fact, the more basic question is whether to be vaccinated or not. So, uh, but let's not get into that now. But you need to pay, you need to discern, you need to make your own uh, decision. Uh, hopefully, it's always in light of faith, family, and life. 
Can prayer ease anxiety? How? Yes. So much because if we put ourselves in the presence of God, you know, and, and all the things that I cited, that uh, in, in, in prayer, of course, we're, we're focusing on God, we're communicating with Him, we're laying down our problems uh, to Him, our burdens, uh, the crosses that we think we're unable to bear. We're trying to get wisdom from, from God. We're listening to the Holy Spirit. We're asking for, for guidance. So all of this happens through prayer. We need to pray. We need to communicate with, with God. And uh, uh, prayer is uh, one of the most basic ways by which we can truly address uh, fears and worries and anxieties in life. And if we know the Christian life, uh, a number of the things that I've been speaking about here, and we have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, uh, yes, there are things still to be afraid in the world, you know, uh, the, the pandemic, certainly be, be afraid of that. The bad people that are uh, out there, there are a lot of bad people out there. Uh, those who would try to destroy the faith, yes, uh, be afraid of that. But as far as uh, our a life of anxiety, you know, we put all of that at the feet of the Lord. And we know that the Lord loves us, the Lord cares for us, the Lord will always be there for us. And uh, remember, all things work for the good of those who love God or are called according to His purpose. And if ever, of course, we need to also be uh, understanding of the Christian teaching that part of the Christian life is a base of the cross. There will be persecution, there will be suffering, and there will be pain. You cannot just be looking to, to the good life. So, but suffering and pain will come, but you don't need to be anxious about that. It is part and parcel of the Christian life. It will help you to grow in holiness. It uh, it's your privilege to carry, in a very small way, uh, the very cross of Christ. Is Jesus Christ the only way, the only mediator between God, the Father, and man? What then will happen to the title of the Blessed Mother as called Mediatrix, called Redemptrix? Okay, another two hours here. <laughs> and again, there is a disagreement uh, in, in, in the church. Uh, Pope Francis uh, does not agree that we should uh, call Mary comediatrix. Uh, I disagree with him. And uh, in, in, in the church through all of these ages, uh, Mary has been accepted by many as a comediatrix. No? Uh, that just means to say uh, there is only one comediatrix, comediatrix, comediatrix. No? Uh, it just means to say that, of course, there is only one Redeemer, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But to be a co-Redeemer, uh, to work uh, with the Redeemer, you know, and uh, Mary was very much a part of the of salvation. In the very first place, her yes. You know, if she did not say yes to God, you know, to, to bear the Son of God, uh, where would everything be? We actually don't know. Did God have a plan B? But but so right then and there, Jesus, the Redeemer, but it was Mary who gave birth uh, to, 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 to him. You know? And Mary was right there. Uh, in, in the spiritual world that rages, in the book of Revelation, when war broke out in heaven because the, the uh, great dragon was ready to con con, uh, consume you know, the, the, the baby that would be born out of the woman, uh, but but failed, and the woman is Mary, the baby is Jesus, and and what broke out in heaven? Mary was there, in the Garden of Eden, uh, when everything was lost, and God was punishing them. But there was the prophetic word in Genesis three verse uh, fifteen: "I will put enmity, uh, talking to the serpent, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers." Uh, and and of course, uh, uh, the woman. Uh, Mary, who is the new Eve, and the offspring is Jesus, who is the new Adam. And and the conflict, uh, and, and who would actually crush the head of the serpent, is Mary and Jesus. So together, uh, together, uh, Mary was very much a part of this whole aspect of uh, redemption, even though there is only one uh, redeemer. You know? And so the, this, is, uh, this is still a big issue, but it was very much accepted. Uh, in the church by many saints, by many popes, you know, uh, and by so many others. 
So we continue to pray about that, but as far as uh, we, as MFCR is concerned, uh, we are consecrated to Our Lady of the Rosary, also known as Our Lady of Victory. And there we say, uh, we as holy warriors, we recognize Mary as a uh, co-redemptrix. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. God bless you all. Okay, thank you to our servant general who uh, gave us another enriching topic tonight. Um, probably for those asking questions, if you have a very uh, good question that needs a more a longer response, ask it earlier so that we can ask it earlier, like the one on the vaccine and the one on the COVID metrics. Ask it again next week, but ask it about uh, eight o'clock so that you'll be the first one uh, that we can ask. Okay, so let's go to some announcements. All right, it's our 40th year. It's still our 40th year, and we are moving closer to our 40th anniversary this June. All right. Okay, we're at the worldwide meeting with the Servant General. So remind your households and your areas to come and uh, listen every Wednesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Um, we took a break last week, so uh, hopefully they can get back into it, and we have much more... Uh, many more topics to discuss as we move along. Okay, and the MFC online teachings are still every month, every second Monday of the month. So the one for April will be next week. It's every second Monday at 8 p.m. Uh, you can attend it via Zoom if you want to interact, but you can also attend it via Facebook Live or YouTube. And Brew Matters, every Monday night at 8 p.m. Hopefully you caught the first episode last Monday with uh, Kohoy as their guest. It's hosted by Germer and RJ. It's a very interesting, <coughs> excuse me, it's very interesting. They talk about faith, mission, and new evangelization. And were they drinking coffee last Monday? I can't remember. But they were, okay? They were drinking coffee. So Brew Matters, every Monday at 8 p.m on the Live Christ, Share Christ Facebook page. And this Saturday, let's boldly go with the World Servants Congress 2021. So it's a whole day conference, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. Uh, so make sure you're registered. The shirts have uh, been delivered or there's, they started delivering them today, even to ECQ. You will get your shirts to our brothers in servants. Uh, so see you this Saturday, and you should be wearing it when you attend on Saturday. And digital parenting, technology, and its role in the family uh, for the MFC young couples. This is this no April 10, not this Saturday. April 10 at 8 p.m. Uh, via Zoom and via the Facebook page of MFC Young Couples. And the Virtual World Kids Conference. Uh, this coming April 16 to 18, Shine Voyagers of Light. <coughs> Registration fee is 150 pesos. That's without the shirt. If you want to get a shirt uh, during the registration, uh, you can opt in to get a shirt as well. So uh, April 16 to 18, uh, make sure your kids are registered and ready to go. And MFC Handmaids, A Journey of the Heart. May 1 to 2, the Virtual World Handmaids Congress. So you can register through bit.ly forward slash VWHC 2021. Registration fee is 500 pesos with the shirt. So go to the MFC Handmaids page for more information. And the new evangelization conference is on May 22. Um, so this is in the Live Christ, Share Christ page. Uh, every year, it's such a great event to really come together and celebrate the new evangelization and everything that we've been doing for the Live Christ, Share Christ mission. And of course, our 40th anniversary celebration, June 21 to 27, we're building up to it, all these activities, all these conferences to culminate this June 21 to 27 as we celebrate 40 years. So we made it to 40. Can you imagine that? 
Uh, and there's much more. It's going to be very exciting. So make sure that you're healthy, you're safe, and that uh, we all make it to June 21 to 27. And the Virtual World Youth Congress, July 16 to 18, uh, save the date, even if we're just a few months uh, early, uh, you can already save the date. So don't go on vacation during that time, if if we can start going to vacation, not during that weekend, even if it's virtual. Okay, that's it. So I hope everybody is uh, uh, getting healthier, drink your vitamins. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people getting infected. We're all praying for your family members and everyone who has COVID. We hope for your healing and we know it's a difficult time. So if you need someone to talk to, just message our page and we'll be able to reach out to you and uh, really help you get through this uh, difficult time. Um, and hopefully, uh, God's will, everybody will get better and we can all start to serve, one, serve him again through MFC. So thank you for joining us tonight. Make sure you subscribe or you like the page so that you can get updated with uh, everything that we do. So good night and God bless.